orbits in the galaxy. They chose ours. Today, we'll be talking about the 1986 sci-fi horror comedy, Critters, which was directed by Stephen Herrick. As you could tell by the trailer, which featured music from Nightmare on Elm Street, Critters is vintage New Line cinema all the way. Critters. They bite. This movie is actually a longtime favorite of mine. It's an all-out 80s creature feature about vicious little alien fuzzballs with a huge appetite who tear through a small Midwestern town. Let's get to it. Today's review will only have minor spoilers. Back in the day, critters fit in perfectly at the local video store, right alongside ghoulies, munchies, hobgoblins, and of course, the leader of the pack, gremlins. Kids back then couldn't get enough of these nasty little monsters, myself included. Despite all the competition, critters still managed to stand out. The movie had lighter moments, but there was also a darker, rebellious tone which made it one of the more memorable monster movies of the time. The plot of Critters is fairly straightforward. It's essentially a creature feature in the spirit of 1950s B-horror and sci-fi. However, what makes Critters special is there are some creative choices that give the movie an edge. For example, the Critters, or Krites as they're referred to in the movie, aren't necessarily mindless monsters. They're dangerous criminal aliens with mischievous personalities and a language all their own. They also have brains because when the movie opens, the critters bust loose while being transported on an asteroid prison. They steal a ship and escape. Damn. Now when it comes to movie villains in the form of little monsters, the critters are pretty out there. Like Sonic the Hedgehog, they can roll up into balls and speed around. They also have the ability to fire poisonous quills, which comes in handy when humans start poking around. But their most prominent feature, of course, is their teeth, which coincidentally makes them almost as terrifying as Ugly Sonic. Almost. Despite only having a moderate budget, this movie looks pretty polished. Right up front, you can see there was a genuine effort put into the production. We get some solid spaceship sets, practical aliens, and this warden, who reminds me a little of Mojo from the X-Men. The real highlight here are the hired guns assigned to track the critters to Earth and dispose of them. Get the body hunters. These two Play-Doh-faced badasses are named Ugg and Lee. Get it? Ugg, Lee. <laughs> These two guys are more than enough reason to watch the movie. They have the ability to alter their appearance, which is something that makes complete sense for intergalactic bounty hunters. Ugg makes use of his unique ability, and we get an awesome transformation scene where he changes into music rock star Johnny Steele. Johnny's song, Power of the Night, is basically the icing on the 1980s cake. The track was actually written and performed by Terrence Mann himself. And whether you love it or hate it, it's a song that will stick with you. I think I'm in a love it camp. Interestingly, Ugg's partner has a lot more trouble with his identity. Transform. Nothing likes me. He never really settles on one face, and that becomes a running joke throughout the movie. <laughs> We mainly follow the Browns. They're your typical all-American family who live on a farm. The dad is played by character actor Billy Greenbush, who horror fans may recall from Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday. The teenage daughter April is played by Nadine Vanderveld. She's an Emmy-winning actress, producer, and writer who you may recall showed up in another 80s movie about little monsters, Roger Corman's The Munchies. The youngest son in the family, Brad, is played by Scott Grimes. Regarding his performance, producer Rupert Harvey stated, Scott was tailor-made for the role. He was at the center of the craziness, and he had the audience's sympathy. 
I tend to agree. This was Grimes' film debut, and I'd say it was definitely a strong start. And of course, there's the ultimate 80s mom, Dee Wallace. Here she plays Helen Brown, the mother. Wallace is the biggest name in Critters. She's most famous for her role in the blockbuster E.T. Here he is! There's an old... I think you killed him already. By the way, E.T. gets a cameo too here. The family in this movie is very relatable and down to earth. The parents do their best to keep things together day to day. The kids squabble with each other. And Brad tries to get out of going to school by heating up a thermometer and claiming he's sick. But D. Wallace isn't going to be fooled by that trick again. <laughs> 106. The movie gives us just enough time to get to know everyone. And this is important because when the critters invade and the family is forced to fend them off, we actually care and want to see them make it through the ordeal. There are some decent scares, but nothing too over the top. This is PG-13 after all. But to be clear, the movie does have a darker edge, so we get some blood and swears here and there. Holy shit! The small Kansas town in which the family lives, Grover's Bend, is populated with familiar faces as well. Lynn Shea shows up as the plucky police station dispatcher. A very young Billy Zane plays April's latest boyfriend. <coughs> And the grouchy sheriff, Harv, is played by M. Emmett Walsh. This town's a zoo. And if there's one thing every 80s horror movie needs, it's a wacky town drunk. Who may sound crazy, but we know in the end he'll probably be proven right. This is where Don Keith Opera comes into the picture. Ah! Opera plays Charlie, who's sort of like Crazy Ralph from Friday the 13th. He drinks, he rides a bike, and nobody takes him seriously. They're coming, Harv. Mm -hmm. The special effects and critters were handled by the Chioda brothers. They're most famous for their work on Killer Clowns from Outer Space, but they've done a ton of other stuff over the years too. <laughs> so when it came time to bring bloodthirsty alien creatures to life, critters were in good hands. Despite the low budget and the fact that the team only had 10 weeks to knock out the effects, everything here holds up fairly well. I'm a fan of the design of the critters. Their look is simple, but effective. The creatures were actually crafted from a thin latex skin, which was laid over a two-part urethane foam. Their skins were painted with rubber cement paint and covered with moose hair, which was acquired from a taxidermist. The main puppets were 13-inch models with radio-controlled glowing eyes, cable-controlled faces, and limbs, all of which came with awesome on screen. <laughs> The bulk of the action in Critters takes place on the farm. But back in town, we also get some great moments as the trigger-happy bounty hunters stalk around in search of the Critters. The bounty hunters are played straight, but most of the humor in the movie comes about because of the chaos these two cause. So we get our horror fix from the family as they face off against the Critters, and we get our laughs from the tongue-in-cheek bits with the bounty hunters. We want the crates. After all. Who doesn't enjoy seeing locals get roughed up by two maniacs from space? The Kruts. Both of these plots work together surprisingly well, and the movie remains entertaining from start to finish. They've come a long way, and they're hungry. So there you have it, Critters. If you haven't already checked this one out, I definitely recommend it. It's out on DVD and Blu-ray, and at the moment it's streaming for free over on Tubi. For a movie that was originally written off by many as a ripoff of Gremlins, which is pretty far from the truth, this is one that stood the test of time. It also managed to spawn a franchise, which featured even more familiar faces. As far as ratings go, I'd give Critters 4 out of 5 Play-Doh faced bounty hunters. Thanks for watching everyone. If you've seen Critters and have your own thoughts on a movie, feel free to drop a comment below. Don't forget, hit like and sub if you enjoyed this video. Until next time, stay safe, be well, later.